Hello, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here today. And thanks for joining us for this uh, unique virtual town hall, just three days after the signing of the Berlin Declaration on Digital Societies. We have a very full program packed with great speakers, so let me get straight to the point. Uh, never more than today, in the middle of the pandemic, we have realized how important it is to have high quality public services, not just as a tool for efficiency, but to serve and help people. And never more than today, on the day when the European Council has finally reached an agreement to make the respect of the rule of law a precondition to access the fund of next generation EU fund, we realize that even in Europe, we need to protect and cultivate our democracies. The Berlin Declaration, which you all have received uh, in preparation of this round table, is a strong, important collective statement by member states to place digital not only at the heart of public service reform, but of democracy, of rule of law and human rights. And the declaration is in itself a fantastic achievement of the German presidency right at the end. But for us, it's a beginning more than an end. It is now our responsibility, all of us, to turn this statement of value into visible results for all citizens. Uh, my colleague wrote on a recent blog post that one of the five novelties that this Berlin Declaration has introduced is the emphasis on co-creation. And our goal here today is precisely to look at some pioneering initiative on co-creation across Europe and think and reflect together on how they can be scaled up. To do this, we will uh, build on the results of the COBAL, Co COBAL project, a 12 partners consortium funded by Horizon 2020. The two cases that we will present today from Norway and Italy are part of the case studies that were analyzed in COBAL. And the project will end in April. As you can see, there are plenty of initiatives coming up soon. Uh, and we plan to focus very much this initiative on how to deliver human-centric digital government. So let us move straight to the agenda. Uh, after my introduction, we will have Eileen Fuchs, Head of Digital Policy, European Union and International Affairs at the Federal Ministry of the Interior for Building and Community, the German minister. And she was the person in charge leading the work on this declaration. After her presentation, we will have a Q&A. So feel free to add your question into the chat box. And then we will move to the cases. We will listen from Francesco Paolo Schiavo, Director of Ministry of Economy and Finance of Italy. We will talk about the experience lab they have set up to serve, to better serve the 2 million civil servants that they provide services to. And then we will hear from Jonas Scherfer, Chief Information Officer at the Labor and Welfare Service, who introduced some pioneer initiative co-creation initiative to deliver better welfare service to Norwegian citizens. We will close with the, the reflection of Maria Vonenbach, senior researcher, part of the COBAL project team, and who studied some of these cases and will bring some of the insight that, that COBAL has gained. And then we will have a final Q&A uh, on the cases where you can ask for more clarification and information. And you can ask these, uh, these questions throughout uh, the session here today, use the chat. I will then get back to you during the discussion for any uh, to pose the question to our speakers. So without further ado, I think we can move to the first speaker. Uh, please welcome Aileen Fuchs. Aileen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, David. Um, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here today, it's the first time for me uh, at this virtual town hall meeting, and I'm 
yeah, very curious um, to see what's happening with Koval and um, generally to be in touch with you from the Lisbon Council as Paul has was uh, so kind to contribute to uh, our Berlin Declaration itself. So um, that actually leads me right into the topic. Um, I'm delighted to share with you some ideas on human-centric digital government and how to put it into practice, uh, how to put values into practice by uh, giving you the example of our declaration, which is at the heart of our discussion today. What is it all about? Um, one of the aspects uh, I think that is currently, everyone is speaking about it on our agenda, is uh, the digital transformation of our societies. We are witnessing a transition period that in the words of Yuval Noah Harari, who wrote uh, in Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, uh, described it as an unprecedented transformation in the history of life on this planet. So um, I think we all agree on that, being uh, very focused on the matter um, and specialists in it. Um, so um, what was actually happened, though, in the last uh, eight months or past year, actually, is the dimension of this transformation that has been really highlighted and accelerated by the by the current COVID pandemic. So this has a profound impact on our societies from an educational and economic and a behavioral perspective. It has also illustrated how important it is for the public sector to offer well-designed and user-oriented digital tools and services to our citizens and businesses. During the lockdown, many in Europe have relied and continue to rely on digital processes to keep our daily lives and our governments up and running. Uh, the digital transformation of our societies has also brought forth new phenomena and challenges like hate speech, cyber mobbing, fake news. And uh, in addition, there is a growing risk of opening up a digital divide or even deepening an existing digital divide. As some people feel anxious about digitization, security and privacy or find it difficult to keep pace with a rapid technological development. So we, we really need to take uh, such concerns uh, seriously. Um, also, we need to reach out and make sure that our citizens who want to benefit from a digitalized world do in fact have the opportunity to do so. And that actually addresses what you said before, David, on, on co-creation um, and inclusion. So against this background, we have used the opportunity of this German EU Council presidency uh, to initiate and actually successfully negotiate, thank you, a joint EU member state declaration on value-based digital transformation in Europe. And the core idea therein is um, that the public sector shall actually not only offer services, um, but it should lead by example um, and uh, leading uh, by example in what areas. So let me get right to it. Um, it was The declaration was signed uh, just um, three days ago on December 8th at the ministerial high-level conference by the EU member states. Uh, and uh, it addresses um, many important issues like the need for cyber ethics in view of hate speech and cyber mobbing, uh, the importance of the rollout and use of notified electronic identification means on a cross-border basis in the European Union, the need to strengthen digital skills and digital literacy in the public sector, the need to foster interoperability and digital sovereignty in the public sector, and the importance of working towards sustainable and resilient digital societies in Europe. However, what is important in the context of this talk is that the Berlin Declaration strongly emphasizes the need to strengthen digital participation and social cohesion in the European Union. So one of the core principles of the declaration, so you can move perhaps on to the next slide, uh, is that um, all humans, all human beings are equally entitled to be treated with respect and fairness, both in the analog and in the digital sphere. So that actually mirrors very well just yesterday, um, the UN Human Rights Day. Um, so it was actually set in a, in a good context, I think, um, the, the date of, of December, the beginning of December. Um, also, the declaration states that the existing rights, values and the corresponding legal framework of the European Union apply regardless of our means of communication and irrespective of the use of analog, digital, hybrid or integrated formats. And that our common core foundations, such as the rule of law, our concern for human dignity, right to autonomy and shared ethical values must prevail in the digital world. 
European democracy must be protected from both disinformation and outright attacks on elections with due respect for the freedom of expression. So you see what I mean when I said leading by example. So it's uh, the the um, Berlin Declaration is um, a follow up of Tallinn, as um, you can see in the slides, but um, it is actually um, uh, builds on what, what was agreed there on digital government, but it puts digital government at the use of a value-based digital transformation uh, by aiming um, for the for the public sector to lead by example in actually um, putting the the principles that are stated therein into practice. So um, by signing this declaration, the member states uh, agreed as a self-commitment on a number of concrete actions to put the political principles um, of the declaration into practice. So you can... Um, Move on to the next slide, perhaps, and see the principles. Um, so um, the question for us was, when negotiating this, is how do you put such noble political principles into practice with actions? So by, by, by an intensive and cooperative consultation process, we have achieved on inter alia the following agreements um, that might be of interest for the discussion today. So. Um, with regard to strengthening the validity of respect and fundamental rights and democratic values, the first principle, we and the other member states will, for example, engage in strategic projects with the aim of increasing awareness of the relevance of a value-based digital transformation, for example, by building platforms to exchange and further develop national and European strategies with regards to digital transformation. So you could call them, for example, digital roundtables. That's one example of an action. And also, um, for example, to encourage the establishment of ethical and technological expert councils to provide advice to and foster debate among citizens. Of course, these um, expert councils in some member states already exist, but perhaps they need to focus more on the discussion when it comes to digital transformation, uh, especially. Also, um, another principle, um, so foster social participation and digital inclusion. Uh, of a lot of interest here in this round today, I think. Uh, we and the other EU member states uh, will, as actions, for example, encourage citizens and government administrations to more strongly explore the use of digital tools in shaping the political discourse on digital transformation. So e-participation, for example, uh, could, be, could be one of the measures. Um, make public services fully available via standard mobile devices and accessible for persons with disabilities, including secure possibilities for EID, for electronic identification, which is also um, a, a very concrete example of where the public sector can lead by example in enabling inclusion. And for example, also an action, pay particular attention to diversity, inclusiveness, and gender equality when fostering digital competencies in the public sector. So it's also a matter of, do actually the public sector employees know what they do when they digitize services? What are they looking for? What is actually uh, their focus and what needs to be more uh, put into focus? So um, we've also called upon the European Commission and the other EU institutions in the Berlin Declaration to facilitate uh, this process. Um, and uh, the European Commission has agreed to work closely with us um, and uh, has also participated many, uh, has, has actually um, uh, put a lot of the um, discussion that was ongoing uh, in the steering committee for this declaration uh, and has aligned it with existing or planned policy on EU level. So um, there are several you can find in the declaration but one example is uh, to launch a digital skills platform, which will be able, uh, which will be a one-stop shop for digital skills initiatives, including new technologies like AI and cybersecurity, self-assessment tools, and related information from all over Europe in 2021. So this is actually quite tangible already. Mm. So um, what will we do to um, ensure the implementation of of these? the goals and actions and processes. Um, so the EU member states have agreed to present their implementation progress in an annual progress report um, administered by the relevant um, uh, presidency um, and then ask the European Commission for support in setting up an appropriate monitoring mechanism. So this needs to be still worked out, but um, it's already good that we have agreed on a, on a reporting or monitoring um, mechanism. 
Um, also, the EU member states have, agree have underlined that the funds provided for digital transformation in the MFF and the uh, Next Generation EU Recovery Effort Fund may have the potential to support inter alia the achievement of these common goals and the implementation of the actions and measures outlined in the declaration. So there is a connection made with the MFF now in a good way, I hope, um, that will actually contribute to these ac actions and measures. And also, um, uh, the, the member states have called upon the European Commission to take note of the declaration when setting up new EU policies, such as the new digital government policy, the interoperability strategy, or the new digital compass requested by the European Council. So we need to align our efforts and strategies and uh, have uh, actually put a lot of thought and, and time into assessing what's going on and how can this be merged with our efforts from the Berlin Declaration. And last but not least, the uh, French uh, EU Council Presidency will take stock of the implementation of the declaration. And the incoming Portuguese EU Council Presidency will support, promote and extend the declaration's principles and objectives by presenting a Lisbon Declaration that focuses on economic cooperation for digital transformation, value-based digital transformation. So uh, we have aligned it with the TRIO efforts uh, and with the upcoming presidencies. So summing up, the Berlin Declaration is a prime example in our view of um, how by means of an intensive consultation and a strong spirit of cooperation, uh, abstract political principles can be translated into concrete actions and monitoring measures. So we, as, as Harari uh, says, we cannot stop history, but we can influence its direction. So we should take this insight uh, as a guiding light for the ongoing digital transformation and try to uh, lead by example also as as uh, Commission Vice President Festaga, who was present at the ministerial conference on Tuesday, so nicely phrased. So we're looking forward to seeing uh, these agreements and activities um, flourish under the incoming presidencies. And uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, discussing this with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen, for this comprehensive view of the background, the thinking and the content, the content of the declaration. Uh, there is a lot of meat, a lot of food for thought here, and we are running a bit late, but we have some questions that I would like to mention. Um, two, two, one is Professor Junginger. Uh, hi, nice to see you, Sabine. A question which is very important. How are the human-centered capabilities fostered and developed within the public sector, so they show skills, but also who are the guardians of these core principles, in your view, in policy, strategy, and implementation? Who could be the guardians, and how do we build the, the skills and the capabilities in the public sector? Yes, uh, I think uh, I read it here in the chat. So um, does the declaration distinguish between these two principles? That's, uh, I think, a very good question. Um, I think that um, the user-centric design comes from very much from the public service debate. So how do we um, actually take on the needs of, of the users, whereas the human-centered design actually reflects the value discussion. So um, what um, in our core rights and values should be reflected in the design of services. So it's not just about user usability needs so but it's also about bringing the discussion of values and and uh, the the fundamental rights discussion and value discussion into the design um, and um, then um, uh, how who are the guardians of these core principles well may it's it's of course um, when we design the public services, it must be the people who work on it. That's actually in the public sector, the people we employ to do so. It's also our, our public sector employees themselves who think about what services need to be digitized and in what way. So um, we are very strongly building on um, digital skills improvements and, and uh, self lifelong learning at the moment for public sector employees when it comes to digital capabilities. Um, we're setting up a digital academy, for example, in Germany. So it's really a matter of, of governments um, and policymakers to ensure um, that what we deliver as governments uh, in services when we get into direct contact with the users actually adhere to um, the values we, we all um, want to see reflected in the digital world. Excellent. Um, yeah. 
Thanks. Uh, we have uh, Luis Siningras, a partner of Ideo, a famous design company who yes. uh, is insisting on the same issue, building capabilities. But I also want to mention the city of Rotterdam, with the, which points to the crucial issues of the role of cities and uh, how will they be involved. Um, there is an appreciation of the role of cities in the declaration, but concretely, what would be their role? Mm. Well, uh, it's, it reads here, how does and will the uh, EC pay attention to cities in their plans uh, and refers especially, I think, to the Digital Services Act? That's correct. They're barely mentioned, um, even though they're in the place where most citizens reside most of the time. Yeah. Um, what is expected from cities? Um, well, this is this is a very important question. I don't actually, I'm not too deep into the, the commission discussions on the DSA on, on ref, just um, on the on the focus of cities, but I know that we in Germany um, work very intensely on um, creating smart cities. So we are uh, we've as, we've at the Ministry of the Interior um, mm -hmm. set up a, a, quite a big um, funding program for smart cities and uh, the different cities and municipalities can enroll for it and um, uh, actually uh, yeah they can they, they will receive many of them have and, and should receive funds um, we have had very we had so many applications um, so we're trying to the, the big challenge is now how to uh, direct the money and get it to the cities that actually have the most chances of putting these really uh, ideas they have into practice really. So I think the cities are definitely a very important focus. Um, however, we also need to have a look at what's happening uh, in rural areas. So um, that's the topic of digital inclusion when it comes to uh, areas as in Germany, for example, where you have a very rural areas where they have very, very bad broadband connection and people are actually digitally um, cut off from many developments. Uh, this is also something that is very much bothering us uh, mm -hmm. and it needs to be um, reflected in, in infrastructure, in, in a broadband. Um, it needs to be also when, when we speak about 5G uh, implementation, this needs to be um, very high on the agenda and it actually is now. So um, we're, we're late, but we're there, we have uh, kind of caught on, I think. Excellent. Thank you very much. Look, uh, there are plenty of comments and questions, but uh, we'll leave them for uh, after the speakers uh, coming in. So let's now move to the next presentation. Um, let me stop my sharing. Uh, so next, uh, next up is uh, Francesco Paolo Schiavo, director of the Ministry of Economic and Finance of Italy, bringing an example of applying co-creation the heart at the core of government, not in a, in a, you know, in a remote uh, um, service, but really where something that serves so many civil servants, so such an infrastructural service. And uh, Francesco Paolo, the floor is yours. Chrisa, can you? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, could you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this meeting. And um, thank you very much in general for uh, inviting us to participate to the COVAL project. Uh, this is very, very interesting for us. I, as you already uh, said uh, at the beginning, presenting me, um, my directorate, uh, what I want to say that my directorate is um, in addition to the traditional task uh, of IT uh, service provider, we have res the responsibility of managing the payroll system for over 2 million civil servants uh, that are around uh, two thirds of the total public employees uh, um, in Italy. Um, my in my speech, uh, I will try to focus uh, um, on on our experience in particular uh, of the, to explain the advantages and um, of a of an inclusive approach uh, and uh, co-creation in the context of uh, organizational changes that technology requires in the public administration. Um, the first question is why is the, does the Ministry of Economy 
pay salaries on on behalf of the entire Italian administration. And this is an historical competence. Uh, this is deriving from a law introduced before the First World War. And this, this law is still in force. Uh, what is interesting is how in the last 10 years, um, this responsibility, this historical competence has radically, radically transformed from a pure administrative bureaucracy procedure uh, due to the introduction of new technologies and is now moving towards the provision of services to users rather than just recipients. The slides you see presents some main st stages of technological innovation and also includes uh, two key moments when organizational changes were carried out. One, as you can see, in 2014, and one that is being currently implemented in this year, the 2020. It's very important. Uh, the, the turning point, I think, of the transformational process um, was, happened in, uh, took place in 2010 with the Paisley being published on the portal rather than sent by post as traditionally done. It, is, it was not a particular relevant change from a technological point of view, but it was very important in terms of process and disrupting the relationship with customers. A change that, as you can see in the slide, can be summarized with the expression from push to pull. Afterwards, there has been a, a continuous chase between the supply and the demand for of services from the expansion of self services or uh, the use of mobile uh, solutions and so on. And this transformation process was fast and it was supported by the identification of cutting edge solutions relevant for the public administration. And among these cutting edge solutions, I want to to um, to focus on the adoption of co-creation methods in the design of new services. And for these, uh, we have all created a, a, a new physical spaces uh, in our offices dedicated to these moments of co-creations. And we have learned a lot in this field. Uh, transformation process could not be carried out with the, the traditional ministerially bureaucratic machine uh, that is typically working in silos. Therefore, in 2014, as I said, a deeper reorganization process took place, introducing a horizontal, horizontal structure of the office's competences according to the factory approach. However, this organizational review was a top-down process, as normally happens in, a, in public, in the Italian, at least, public administration. This has produced a strong resistance to change, conflicts of competences between offices, and a long time needed for the process to be um, uptake. Moreover, some detailed choices turned out to be difficult to be implemented and therefore wrong. The digital transformation is widespread, especially with the adoption of cloud paradigm. New strategic, strategic drivers are standing out, requiring new organizational adjustments, as you can see, such as value of data, security by design, and so on. You can read in the slide, but these are well-known drivers and there is no need to me for, to develop further on them, but I mentioned because starting from these strategic directions and taking the advantage of the co-creation experience we have, we have um, learned, that we paved a completely different path to design the new organization. The first step is the design or the organizational chart and the skills analysis. Then we move toward the process design and its requirements in terms of human resources and instruments, including logistics. 
we have used these co-creation methodologies and we involved in these the all, and I repeat, the all people working in my directory, all the staff who was involved in this process of co-creation, so they could share their knowledge and experience. The new organization was designed through an iterative, including human-centric and transparent process, starting from the bottom, reaching a final outcome where everyone in the organization took part. Although the organization process has not been complete, some advantages are already clear. These are the resistance to change, but also the promptness in identifying the best solutions, as well as the matching between the processes design and the needs related to the provision of services. But what are the main challenges in adopting this co-creation path, at least the one that I noticed. First, uh, the slide you see highlights what has been done in a nutshell, but these are just few numbers. There is a lot of more that we have done. First of all, and what are these challenges? First of all, co-creation can be improvised, improvised, but requires to be planned, and carefully organized. In our case, the use of European Commission's reform support program was of great help. Another key factor is a cultural one, namely the acceptance of an informal sharing of strategic choices that would be otherwise traditionally reserved to a small management team. Finally, it requires everyone's commitment, at least in terms of time. However, greater effort is probably avoided as the new organization gets underway. This is, if I can, I want to tell an episode because I, am, I was aware of the success of the process when at the meeting in which I described the new, or, uh, the new organizational chart, I felt our staff fully aware of the reasons behind all different choices, regardless whether they were fully shared or not. And this is the real success. All what are aware a part of the decisions. Uh, digital transformation is not, uh, we need a, a process of digital transformation with the, the collaborative work that I described are not limited to organization, but to open up the digital um, public administration perimeter, uh, institutionalizing ecosystem composed of public and private actors to create new services and, or improving existing ones. And we are now uh, involved in this process as we might as a public administration. So, complete my presentation. Thank you very much. I close with the Virginia Barden uh, sentence that I think is synthesize what I've said. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And it applies, I think, to the European Union as well perfectly. So uh, thanks a lot. We are running just a few minutes late. So please, uh, I see a lot of activity in the chat. So go on. Discussion is very much happening in the chat, even if we don't mention it. And I will now give the floor to the next speakers. Uh, the next speaker is Jonas Scherpe. It's Chief Information Officer at the Labor and Welfare Service Norway, and they've implemented co-creation at the core of delivering welfare services to Norwegian citizens, and we are eager to learn from this. The floor is yours, Jonas. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, the Norwegian Labour and Welfare Administration now administers a third of the national budget through schemes such as unemployment benefits, work assessment allowance, sick leave benefits, pensions, child benefits, and cash or care benefits. For years, NAV has trailed the Norwegian Tax Authority in user satisfaction and public reputation. So one interesting question to ask is, 
Isn't it surprising that an organization built to collect taxes is more favorably viewed than an organization tasked with ensuring the income of the tax citizenry? So part of the explanation is the Norwegian Tax Authority's visionary digital transformation that started almost 20 years ago. But part of the explanation might also be on a human level. While paying taxes is a responsibility that most Norwegians accept with pride, accepting benefits and support services may challenge people's sense of self-worth and, and dignity. In addition, now services are often intertwined with services from other sectors, such as health and education. This interaction of services from other parts of government affects how citizens perceive NAV. Many of our users are in difficult life situation. They may have lost their job recently. They may have an illness with an unclear diagnosis, or they may even have terminally sick children. NAV has historically not understood well enough how this context must impact the services that we provide. Too often our users have met a system that is transactional and correct, but with a complexity surpassing their cognitive capacity to navigate it given their situation. The result is an experience of a bureaucracy with a lack of quality and compassion. So what are we doing to change this? It is more than I can cover in this introduction, but I will point to three of the most important changes in the digitalization of our services. How we organize, what skills we employ, and how we collaborate. <clears throat> so we organize around users. Previously, we set up projects that improved parts of the service. The scope of the, of the project was often based on how we organize work internally. For example, how to make the sickness benefit case processing better. Today, we have established what we call product areas aligned to the user situation. A product area is a collection of cross-functional product teams that plays a role in the same life event or life situation. A product area typically engages between 50 and 100 people, which is small enough to have a shared vision for the user experience and large enough to create a consistent service across a set of contact points. So not only improving the sickness benefit case processing, but also developing digital products for following up on the users throughout their sick leave until they're back in work while also facilitating communication with doctors and employers. Product teams and product areas will evolve, but they do not have a start and an end date. Consistency over time, a long-term view, and continuous learning are fundamental to better services. As Brandolini says, software development is a learning process where working code is a side effect. We have started modeling the life event across the whole public sector as well. The Norwegian government has initiated work around seven life events that should be met with seamless services across the public sector. But that is a little less mature for now. We have built capabilities around understanding users. We have hired social anthropologists as design researchers, and we have hired service designers, product designers, accessibility experts, and data scientists. These colleagues are integrated in the cross-functional product teams with software engineers and legal experts. They have the skills, tools and methodologies to create quantitative and qualitative insights that provide vital context of the user situation and feedback loops on the services we provide. The users and interest groups are both metaphorically and often directly involved in the software development process. We expect the whole cross-functional team to understand the context of, of the users. This enables the teams to understand the user's context and the user's need. 
We see the effect of teams empathizing with the users, not only the designers, but also the software engineers and the legal experts. So, see effect of these changes? Well, yes, user satisfaction has increased and the number of calls, for example, to our contact center has decreased. We see this trend clearly for the services that are being developed in this model. But I think that the long term effects are equally important outside the team and the product areas. The human centric digital government is ultimately a more effective government because it understands the effect of its policies and services. So I think I ran out uh, there. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Many thanks. Uh, very inspiring presentation. A lot of food for thought. Uh, let's move quickly to uh, the next speaker. Uh, Marie, Maria uh, Ronenbach from uh, the Cobalt Project, researcher of the Cobalt Project from the Inline Norway University, who has run a case that is on the case that we just learned and in general on the research finding of Cobalt. Maria? The floor is yours, and uh, if you can keep it uh, in seven minutes, we will have room for questions and even interventions at the end. Maria, I've sent you a request to unmute. You have to do it from your screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. You can all hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so I'm working on the Kuval project and I will uh, present some insights from our work on, on the research. In Kuval, we explore co-creation at different levels and from different perspectives related to digital transformations, living apps, social innovation, uh, and as related to service design and co-design. So I've been leading uh, a research team that has mainly worked on co-creation and design. And this has, among others, allowed me to zoom in on some of the digitalization processes in the Norwegian Labour and Welfare Services, which was nicely presented in the, in the previous uh, presentations. Uh, so, more specifically, I have worked with a case study on a project called Simplified Follow-up in NAV. Uh, a long-term challenge for the organization has been to find ways of ensuring tailored, individually tailored counseling and follow-up of potentially vulnerable users with reduced capacity to work. This persistent challenge uh, in the organization was the background for initiating the simplified follow-up project, uh, which aimed to develop a new concept that would improve follow-up for users and frontline employees. The project was explicitly based on a, a service design methodology uh, to ensure a, a holistic and user-centered approach. The processes as well as the results uh, of this project are interesting and I think they provide a valuable case for learning which is transferable to other public service contexts. So first, uh, we found that involved actors in the project uh, found that ser the service design approach brought forward a more fundamental user centrism compared to what they had worked with in the past. This user centrism is not about focusing on the user, but it's about taking the user's focus. So by taking the user's focus in this project, um, uh, taking the perspective of the user, it led to some basic but important insights. The users of NAV, they simply wanted to be seen and heard. While there's far more to the insight work in the project than this, this is just my simplified uh, summary at this point. So with this shift of perspective, uh, it resulted in the development of a digital, digital activity plan uh, that work as a collaborative online tool that facilitate interactions between caseworker or counselors and, and users on more equal terms. It also involves an integrated chat for direct communication between the users and, and the caseworkers. So we also find that these new solutions, uh, they challenge these deep-rooted asymmetries between frontline employees and the users, and they do in fact facilitate co-creation of services in daily service interactions. As a researcher, we all we often have a sort of a critical perspective, and we are sort of struggling with the fact that this 
there's so many positive aspects of this this new solution actually so overall the new solution uh, that came out of the project seems to have led to improved administrative processes and serv service interactions uh, as seen from both sides both the users and the frontline employees uh, there's more nuances to that but at least this is what is indicated in our case study and also this shift that the uh, project represents towards more user centrism, uh, more design approaches, is also uh, a broader organizational change, which which Jonas explained uh, uh, in the in his presentation. However, our study also shows that shifts towards more digitalized service encounters require a combination of communication through other channels at the same time because some users prefer and can cope with digital communications, but others do not. So effective digitalization strategies uh, require uh, a combination of uh, effective channel strategies. I think that counts for many organizations. Uh, and overall, developing digital government involves far more than technical artifacts and programming. Technology is entangled with serious organizational changes and need to be understood and treated in this way, not as something detached from broader organizational changes. Finally, I think we need to be constantly reminded that a technology does not drive organizational transformations. People do. People develop technologies, people make choices about which te technology to use, about how to use it, and people determine the impact of technology by the way they put put it to use in diverse context. So this aspect is some, something that uh, sometimes get lost in public policy and in, in research dialogues on digital governments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, we have uh, exactly 10 minutes left and uh, we have room for uh, many of your questions coming in. But First, I would like to ask Luis Silmingras, who is partner at IDEO, the world famous consultancy and design company, uh, about uh, how do you see this discussion taking the broad view? I mean, I'm sure you, you, you deal with, uh, with companies, with public service all over the world. What's your reflection hearing this debate? What can you bring from, from the broader view that you have uh, in, uh, in the work that IDEO does? You will be unmuted in a second, uh, Krisa. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much for the presentations. I thought they were so so interested, uh, so interesting, and so and fascinating to hear from Jonas, from Maria, from Eileen, from Paolo, from all of you. Um, I, I think what's uh, what's fascinating from uh, building the uh, capabilities that are required in order to lead the transformation, which is. It is, yes, digital first, but it needs to be human and, as Sabine is saying, uh, uh, user and human uh, human first. I think that distinction between human and, and, and user is, is a fascinating one. I mean, you, you could say Amazon is very user-centric, but it's not very human-centric. And we don't want uh, uh, public services that are uh, user-centric like Amazon, but they're not human-centric. Uh, you know, that is what we need to try and get. This is like what's necessary for our public service and right now our public service our public servants don't have the muscles to develop the empathy that is necessary to do those uh, very often i think that many people in the front line have those but very often the ones that are doing the public service heavy lift don't have that kind of muscle of understanding of collaboration of ways of working that is what's uh, like a key uh, almost like school that needs to be developed around europe uh, in order to be um, to be uh, to do this huge um, effort that we need to to develop a much more human uh, uh, kind of community. Excellent, many thanks. And you mentioned Sabine. Uh, Sabine, you have intervened a lot in the discussion. Uh, I wonder if you want to share some thoughts with us. Sabine Junginger, of course. So I don't hear you, your microphone now? Yeah. Go ahead. Sabine, you have to unmute again. 
Yes, I had problems with the audio. Can you hear me? Now, yes. yes. Thank you. So, okay, I'll try that. I'm speaking into the phone while I'm watching the screen. You know how it goes. Um, so, <laughs> anyways, the key question, I guess, is for me, for all of you, um, has to do very much with the capability building internally in the public sector. And there we have noticed that, you know, all of you are really working hard and, and everyone's working hard now to develop these capabilities and introduce uh, methods and, and projects into the public sector. But there is this constant problem that we have um, attrition, be it like in the duck region, you know, Switzerland, Austria, and, and Germany, where you have the skilled people leaving soon. I mean, those who are maybe skilled in, in the uh, retirement age. But anyways, there are a lot of people who either move up or out or whatever. So there's a lot of fluctuation going on. And at the same time, what we also observe and noticed over the past years is that um, the education for civil servants, for public servants, um, is not keeping up with these demands and development so that we leave the educational responsibility to these organizations that are already stretched, already understaffed, already um, under-resourced. And the question is, how can we can, can we take a more systemic approach to that, where we um, ensure that the channels that feed the public sector, so to speak, also is nourished all the time with, with the kind of skills so that um, the burden is not only on the organization all the time, which is really um, not a sustainable way, as we know. And there was an, a suggestion in the, in the chat box about um, having external experts. Of course, you can use external experts, but we also have seen that, especially with management consultants, there is a conflict of interest here when you want to develop capabilities within the organization that actually, in the end, are supposed to eliminate the manager because the organization is trained and capable to do it itself. And so I'm just wondering what uh, what your experience is with that. Is Maybe I'm just making this up from the Duck region or my experience, but um, from your perspective, is there something that you can envision or wish for or that you already see maybe happening that uh, would uh, take this uh, problem a little bit broader so it's not just the organization itself that has to do this heavy lifting? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, who wants to answer among the speakers? So I, I can give uh, one answer, just uh, uh, giving an example from Norway. Um, we have uh, something called Stimulab, which is um, uh, set up to stimulate for more use of uh, design met uh, methodologies uh, to stimulate uh, the consultancies to improve their competence and skills in working more with human-centered design uh, and they also fund projects uh, with um, public sector organizations and consultancies to work collaboratively and uh, they're moving towards more um, uh, working more with with wicked problems and and working in broad inter interdisciplinary teams. Uh, so this is funded by the government to sort of enhance the competence in the more consultancy market, but also within uh, the public sector organisations. I don't know if that uh, was a, a yes. response, but it's a, it's I, an example. Thank you very much. I see that Jonas also wanted to say something. Yeah, so I just want to say that that being able to to hire uh, the best people in the market, be it software developers or designers, has been really fundamental to to what I would call our success. But that means also we have to work in public se sector with a value proposition for these kinds of of roles, and we we have to be able we have to be ready to change how we work in public sector as well because you can't. Uh, get in the top uh, service designers and 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 not change the structure within how how we work. So so I think that's fundamental and 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 the value proposition of public sector is that we have the 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 biggest uh, and most interesting problems to solve. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, uh, Aileen, you wanted to jump in. 
Yeah, I just um yeah, I just have a short I mentioned it before. I think um I actually very much agree with what was said before. Um I think the solution is is combined. So we both need to build more digital skills in the public sector itself to understand what is actually needed, uh, but also to um get good um expert advice and the uh, digital um, uh, savvies from uh, consultancy from software developing into our projects of course they need to be paid well which i think when uh, this is this is of course something that is that is necessary but uh, they don't necessarily have to be employed in public service i don't know if this necessarily is is if, if this actually would benefit because we need ideas from outside too but um, people need to work together closely and of course and that's something I think that that was perhaps lacking before. Uh, we need to involve the users themselves. So um, we set up uh, in Germany digital laboratories for design or redesigning uh, federal government services now and um, for the last past two years. And they actually work together with different focus groups on um, use, user centricity and uh, human centric design. So. Um, but of course, um, it's not all perfect. Um, we're actually meeting um, some tough legal um, boundaries um, that actually reach from competencies on the federal level to uh, data protection issues. So it's not it's not just the competencies. It's also the um, the question of compliance and and uh, structures that need to be um, yeah assessed and taken into consideration. And that often is actually very inhibiting for developing real user centric services and and getting to the uh to the core issues in my view thank you uh francesco paolo would you like to have a last thought before we close uh, you haven't spoken in the second round no you're still muted it's all right okay yes so, Go ahead. just um yeah, but, um, I, I agree with a lot of my colleagues uh, who answered before. Of course, we need experts. I said in my presentation that uh, it's not easy uh, co-creation and uh, um, involving the people, a human-centric approach is, is time-consuming, is difficult, you need to be, be organized. And so we need experts from the market, that's for sure. But uh, the first... The first point is the cultural change inside the public administration. Um, from my point of view, we have we have a chart in our experience center uh, where we try to redesign um, our services. Uh, there is written um, user needs comes first, no exceptions, and this is the first difficulties because when you implement technology in a administrative process. The risk, as once someone wrote in the chat, is to just to redesign the same process. And but if you have the the needs of the users first, uh, so this is a, a radical way of changing the process. So you need the experts from the from from the market, but there is a cultural change before uh, for the who from who has the responsibility of the services inside the public administration. And the example I made of the um, a point, how to spread these uh, uh, the advantages of the co-creation, if it's so difficult, it's time consuming, is to explain the advantages, sorry for the uh, joke of words. When, I, when we started, the, I'm, the example I made, uh, of the use of co-creation inside a redesigner of organization chart is because uh, this is not so common in the public administration. We have example in the private or the public sector of using the co-creation in redesigning the services, but redesigning an organization is not so common. Um, and I was, and I'm tell from my personal experience that I was suspicious starting this process but i learned learned by doing the real advantages of having this approach so if we can spread these advantages inside the public administration this is the right way well to 
adopt the solution and taking all the best from them. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, 1 p.m. here. We are run out of time and we have many questions that we didn't answer and uh, special apologies to Marina, to Christoph uh, and uh, Alexandros and many more. Uh, we have to wrap up. Uh, this is uh, obviously just one uh, step in the, not only in the COVAR project, but in the discussion and most important in the implementation of the Berlin Declaration. I just want to mention that uh, we will follow up on this discussion, continue this discussion in the final scientific conference of COVAR, where actually many of these cases will be presented as self-standing a research paper plus research reports, policy dashboard, and more meetings such as this one. I want to thank all the speakers, not only for the great quality, but also for being concise and respecting the time. Uh, I think we have learned a lot. Um, at the beginning, the speakers were asking me how many people will be there. I said 50 to 70, according to our uh, averages, and we have been, I think, almost 90. This shows the commitment that is behind this, and it also shows that we know that ultimately the guardians of this declaration, and uh, I have to be all of us, it relies on us. We will do our part, not only within COVAL, but also within other projects and our, our activities. And we hope to reconvene with all of you soon in the new year, and most importantly, we hope to reconvene in person uh, as soon as possible, because this will be the sign that things are getting truly better. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy, as I always say, it's a pity that we couldn't address all the questions, but it's also a great sign that we couldn't address them and we will follow up soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.